We appreciate those who did make it. <laughs> uh, the topic of my lecture today is going to be of this biotechnology research center in Emeryville, which is a little warehouse town in between Berkeley to the north, Oakland to the south, San Francisco across the bay, and to the east, everything from Salt Lake City to New York. Um, the reason why I wanted to present this lecture was that the technical series, I think, uh, um, needs to fo is focusing on technical issues. And what I wanted to be able to demonstrate is an integration of architecture and high technology. And then the way that it affects the human environment for people who work in such facilities. And in addition, that projects of this type can, in can show that good design can be integrated with uh, technology. In addition, Oh, no. Yeah, I'd leave it open. Leave it open, just in case it's odd there. <laughs> and that a project of this type, often you see in, say, the Getty Museum or in Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum, that people like Richard Meyer take all the credit for the project or that Frank Gehry is the hero. But in fact, if you look you know at a project. Meyer got paid for the Getty? Uh, I know I got made a profit of $24 million. $100 million. Well, 10% of a billion. No, the <laughs> overall cost is $2 billion. That, okay. To the public, it's $1 billion. Actually, $2 billion. Uh -huh. $100 million. To get, uh, to, 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 to well, that's 5%. That's, that's 5%. That's what it should be. Yeah. But in any case... Um, he gets the highest paid fee ever, ever paid to an architect in history. Is that right? So it's, presumably, that's the greatest structure ever built. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> no, ask the, during the process. So you know what to go for. Yeah. Right, right. If you guys have any questions during the process, just, just ask um, instead of my just talking and asking for questions in the end. But in any case, um, uh, a project of this type w involves hundreds of people, and everybody is key in the project. While the architecture is a reflection of the philosophy of Ricardo Legareta, a project of this type is not going to happen unless you have many different people involved in the process, both the people who founded the company, people who were involved in the production of it, the scientists themselves, and the people who actually build the building. So it's a very integrated process. And so for SciArc students, I'd want to iterate the, the importance of the collaboration process, that design is not necessarily always one in which you're just a singularly a designer and you have a few ideas about proportion or the body, but in fact, negotiations with the city, the negotiations with the scientists, the process of working with everybody from engineers to laboratory planners is just as critical to the design um, resolution of a project of this type. Anyway, focusing on Emeryville itself is that there, it is a warehouse district based in the, in the 1910s that um, uh, that was carved out between Oakland and Berkeley in order to be able to contain the sin and vice of prostitution and uh, gambling and so forth. And What's the main drug supply of the uh, Probably, probably. And in addition, well, in fact, when I was in the lab, when I was helping cleaning out the laboratories early on, they you find drug dealers walking around, uh, and not drug dealers of the pharmaceutical type. <clears throat> So, um, in any case, so Emeryville has been going through a transformation in the last 15 to 20 years because it was uh, in the middle of a lot of economic activity and it just was overlooked for all these years until just recently. So it's begun to renovate into um, mixed-use housing, new retail complexes, et cetera. And Chiron moved in here 20 years ago because they were so interested in the uh, just raw space that was available nearby the University of California and University of California at San Francisco as well as Berkeley. These are the typical types of warehouse spaces, low rise, brick construction, concrete, um, roads that haven't seen any repairs for years. And then uh, larger plants. This is a, a Sherman Williams uh, paint plant across the way there. So there's a lot of industrial activity here as well. I know that everybody knows about genetic engineering and that, that I just want to reiterate the, the revolution that is going on today in genetic engineering that um, we went through is a slide splicing? I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> this gene splicing, you know how the, uh, <laughs> it's an image that uh, indicates that. Anyway, um, while we had electronics revolution in the 1960s and we had a revolution of uh, expansion across this country in the late uh, 1800s, 
we're undergoing an incredible transformation in the understanding of biological sciences based on research uh, from the 1950s and 1960s and the advances in um, uh, imaging by electron microscopes and the ability of, ability of computers to be able to keep track of sequences of DNA, which is the basic code within the cell of a human being that tells um, a cell to divide, to replicate, to become blue eyes, whatever the case might be. So the understanding, a fundamental understanding of genetic engineering has advanced incredibly over the last years. This is an image of a, what's called a macrophage, which is this thing that floats around in your blood, gobbling up things like bacteria, which is indicated here, or viruses, and it actually cruises along, jumps on top of it, sucks it in, and denatures it, meaning breaking it apart. And it actually has tendrils that comes out to grab onto these things. It's a pretty cool thing. It's a monster. It, it is a monster. It's, um, this is a, um, an image of a manufacturing facility. Once uh, products are understood within the laboratories, they are then brought to a facility of this type. And there's large fermenters that will grow vast quantities of the kind of drugs that you might be interested in. And in this case, Chiron produces something called interleukin-2, which is used for uh, cancer research and cancer therapy. They also do things like diagnostics, um, vaccines, um, eye care, et cetera. So this is representing the, really the revolution of uh, biotechnology in becoming a, a product that can be sold. This is their existing facilities, which is a 1930s Shell Oil Research Building. Um, you can see the old Shell building. They moved into this about 15 to 17 years ago, took up the first three floors with laboratory space. But they're just outgrowing a facility of this type. Um, they recently merged with another company, and this is a manufacturing facility that they have to maintain. They're taking, grabbing whatever warehouse space they possibly can within Emeryville because they just are expanding so much, but they don't have, they didn't have the time to be able to build a full-blown center of biotechnology research. They would just grab warehouse spaces of this type, um, built a cheapo tilt-up uh, concrete construction on the back of the parking lot or moved into uh, another warehouse space um, nearby. But you can see actually the, the brick construction here, the concrete construction that's typical in the area. And you actually you'll see in the project later on the attempt to use these types of materials in that so that would blend into the, um, into the fabric of Emeryville to a certain degree. This is uh, another research building. And this is a research building that's further uh, to the north that they moved into about 12 to 13 years ago, and I was actually involved in the design work of the upper floors on this, the second and third floors. And they have to vacate this building within the next year. So part of what was driving this new complex is the fact that they just, they did not own this building and it didn't make any sense to continue to rent in a place like this, especially when it's, um, this was a spec, spec office building with very low uh, floor to ceiling height, so it was very difficult to be able to, to put in the required utilities up in the ceiling space there because you had such small amount of space between the suspended ceiling below and the concrete floor plate above. But we wedged it in there. This is the floor plan of the second floor. And basically what makes for a typical laboratory facility, and this is this representative of the new thinking of laboratory facilities, which was to try and bring the scientist out to the exterior of the building so that they would have natural light and be able to take advantage of the views out towards San Francisco. And that uh, there was a concern about the dehumanization of scientists and that now that scientists are making up such a, a larger percentage of our population and the fact that um, scientists are encouraged to try and spend, spend as much time in the lab, you want to make these as reasonably humane as possible, considering you're in the thick of being in a laboratory space. So the basic design of this is you have a uh, laboratory along the exterior there. Along the, on the next level in is a set of support spaces that has things like centrifuges, fume hoods, cold rooms, things that the scientists would want easy access to, but would in fact would not need to go to it all the time, and in fact does not need the natural light in the same way that these spaces do. Um, you would have a uh, loop circulation system that comes around, allowing people and services to be able to move easily through the facility. And then within the core is a set of biological hazard rooms or clean rooms that 
do not need natural light, are not used all the time, and they need to be shared by different scientists in different laboratories. And these are the kind of rooms that have what's called positive pressure, which is the heating, ventilation, and cooling creates a positive pressure within this space here so that airflow continues to go out and does not allow contaminants to come in. In addition, on this floor, you'll have things like office suites that will um, service uh, laboratories. So these might be a shared set of principal investigators so they can um, be one another, near one another but still have their own labs that uh, they need to be near. In this building, you actually have, like I said before, you have uh, stairs that come up here. I didn't say it before. Um, <clears throat> elevators, bathrooms, um, stairs up in here. How many, how many uh, scientists will that accommodate that floor? This floor is about, I'd say, tw 10 principal investigators who are the chief scientists. Then underneath them, they might have 7 to 10 uh, working scientists underneath them include everything from RAs, people who just recently graduated from school, to principal investigators or second lieutenants. So each lab would have maybe 10, so I'd say 70 to 80 scientists per floor here. And then with all the additional um, support staff and so forth, I would imagine it get up to about 150 per floor. Mm -hmm. This is the next floor up. Um, let me make a last point here. Um, this is a uh, sort of a formal boardroom, uh, conference room here. And traditionally, a, a room such as this type would be placed on this side of the building, allowing f uh, to take advantage of the uh, better views and so forth. But in fact, something like this is only used maybe once or twice a day. On the top floor of, the, of this building, the third floor, there's a lunch room that's here um, and a kitchen that uh, adjoins onto it. So instead of having the executive conference room here, you actually make a place for all the scientists and all the staff to be able to enjoy the views out into the, um, into the bay. So it, it becomes a much more egalitarian environment. Um, again, the, this is a very similar plan to what you have down below. Laboratory suites on the outside, support space on the interior, the clean type rooms on, on, in the central core that, again, does not require much natural light. Can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, in the planning of this is obviously because of di diagonals, a huge amount of wasted space. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, is this is this a site issue or was it an aesthetic issue? Uh, well, the, the I mean, I can see whole areas of uh, you know there are lots of triangles that are dead dead space. That's right, and that was the design of the building by the spec office builder actually. Really? Yes. We, uh, Chiron just moved in and just tried to make the best of the lousy situation, everything from the floor to floor heights to actually the configuration of it as well. Um, his it's intent very, very weird decisions. As they, not like, like in this area here, they've introduced all the problems that are around here. It's as, it's as if they're not even happy with that. They, if they could have kept this rational. That's right. And yet they imported this grid again so that they have that problem recurring everywhere. Right. And actually to build them, there was, uh, even to lay that out, yeah. uh, even as a form that's as simple as this was quite a headache. Did you this? I mean, when you were No, no, it was already built before even. Already, I thought you said you worked on this. I did. But the form of the building was already in place. Oh, uh, just, just the, the shell and the, the core was in place. We just came in and configured the, uh, the actual floor plan of the so laboratory. You, you got it as efficiently as you could then. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and so the thing is what they wanted to do was actually maximize the views for corporate offices and make it as, and then you'd actually have... Uh, well, that's just secretaries back there, right? Back in here. Yeah, Who knows? We're all the anomalies. In this space here, yes. Uh, so, so in any case, uh, uh, this, this has worked for them, actually. But in the long run, they really need to, they need to actually vacate this space. But um, the view from that conference room there is actually really worth uh, taking advantage of. Um, San Francisco over to the side there, Golden Gate Bridge, Treasure Island, Marin County to the north. And that's uh, our hero over there. Who's your, oh, is that you over there? No, no. <laughs> our hero, the scientist. <laughs> the beard comes and goes. <laughs> that's right. I've been through a few beards. I've <laughs> our hero. <laughs> So this is a laboratory that I think works extremely well. It has all the basic planning ideas in mind about the um, putting the scientists up against the glass, allowing for those views that you saw on the previous slide. A series of writing tables in, uh, along the edge of the benches, and then actual workspace for the scientists. And at the end of 
every other island is a uh, wash basin and sink uh, glassware area. And then backing up against the wall and the other, uh, along this side are things like fume hoods, for example, which um, if you're working with very toxic chemicals or you're worried about the, um, uh, if you're worried about um, contamination of your, um, of your um, experiments, then you would actually uh, work in fume hoods like this. And actually these have their own special filters that filter out any noxious chemicals so they don't get ejected out into the, our fine city. And then you have things like uh, refrigerators and so forth, and then chromatography columns along the site, which are long columns that uh, separate out different materials inside there. So these are all things that need to be, have easy access within the lab, and they're not noisy. The noisy things, like centrifuges that spin up to, say, 10,000 RPMs, need to be put into the secondary suite, which is almost a just generic open space that will allow for plenty of lab, bench space, workspace, centrifuge space, fume hoods, and a pharmaceutical cold room. This is in a whole ice box that's refrigerated down to, say, 34 degrees or so. Um, and that actually is chilled by something on the roof, and it's, it's quite interesting. And then there's a... Oh, excuse me, yeah? Who established the, uh, the parameters for these labs? There was an in-house engineer, and there's also... Was he pretty good? No, he was pretty good. He wasn't very good at being able to visualize spaces, and that's actually where I came in. They actually went through a whole round with a um, architect down in the South Bay, and they came up with some plans, but nobody was happy with it, and so they decided to try and work things out in-house. And uh, strangely enough, I actually got involved with it because I was helping my dad out to do some Xerox copying, and so I happened to talk to the vice president, and he said, oh, why don't you go talk to, um, to Bill? And I said, Sounds like a film business. <laughs> that was very funny. <laughs> So the, the parameters of this were, this for example is a purification lab in which after you've created the product, you need to take the product and separate it out of the soup and the mix that you fermented it in and be able to derive the um, drug that you're interested in that's completely pure. So um, that had a certain set of requirements which were we need this much lab space, I have this much, um, this number of people that uh, work for me and I had to have enough room for my chromatolic chromatography columns, for example. So um, different labs were di of different sizes on the plans that you could see according to specific requirements. What you'll see in the upcoming project, however, is that they wanted to change over to what's considered to be a generic lab space, one that can be flexible and adaptable to different kinds of uses. And a rubber stamp. Hmm? A rubber stamp. Rubber stamp. Well, you can't rubber stamp too much, but in any case, that was the general intention. This is a view of one of the laboratories you can see. A typical lab bench across here, shelving above that uh, you can get easy access to, a suspended ceiling, a uh, wash basin, and then this is a uh, fume hood, which has glass across here, and then it's vented up into the ceiling. And then this is a view of the secondary space that was right next to the lab so you can get easy access to more open uh, bench space and a cold room in the back there. Who did your set design? <laughs> oh, uh, you gotta love things like this, funny. you know. <laughs> uh, Stephen? Yeah. Is there an um, importance to what colors you use inside the lab? On the lab benches themselves, unfortunately, you're really limited because of problems of staining and so forth. Um, that only some ben colors can be used integral into the lab bench tops because if you use like an orange or it just somehow compromises the um, compromises the countertop so it, it doesn't clean very well and it's not resistant to things like acids or bases or whatever. Um, the ceilings and flooring materials, there's a little bit more leeway in that but even there um, there's a very limited amount of, um, of Because of maintenance? or because of the effect that, that might have There just simply hasn't been a call for different colors. I mean, if you can find a ceiling track that's burnt umber, for example, that would be great. Um, I think that it's a question of maintenance. Also, if these ceiling tiles get popped out, you want to be able to replace them um, and, and not have to have some warehouse full of ceiling tiles of some kind of magenta, for example. Actually, a lot of this is in reaction to the older labs, I worked in a lab, a biophysics lab at the University of Chicago in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And it was all brick and dark. And, <clears throat> and so uh, the, the guy who was in charge of finding out funding, and he just turned the whole thing white. For two reasons. Number one, it's easier to keep clean and figure out 
where things were. And second, you're t constantly doing meetings on instruments and yeah. stuff like that, and you get a lot more value. Yeah, this is what, what I... Um, so this is kind of a reaction. This is kind of a reaction to the old labs, which are really dark. And, you know, they kind of evolved from the 19th century. But it's always. important to have uh, kind of like um, um, no color environment so you can read the instruments and see... Well, that's not entirely true. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're this backing up... to the old, because I think... Now they're getting to warmer, warmer type spaces. Right, and people have to spend a lot of time in here if it's dark and and dank feeling. You know, it's not as uh, it's more oppressive. So you want to have a place that people feel sort of comfortable in. But I think they're getting there's an attempt now, and in fact, in some of the designs of the say faces of the uh, lab uh, drawers and so forth, there's actually some uh, changes in colors that are available now, and there's. It's coming along, and any number of different manufacturers want to be able to capture a market in which clearly, quote unquote, humanization of the laboratory environment is becoming more important. Then these are the key players that um, were involved in the, the development of Chiron is, and Ricardo Legareta there. And it's interesting that um, the way this began was that c before you saw that they're all in the, they're, everybody's in these different locations, and actually the company went around with several different architects, and it, they, it was pretty disastrous all, all around. So um, that's my dad. This is Bill Rudder, who, along with uh, Ed Penhoet, founded Chiron in 1982. Bill Rudder, you would really consider to be one of the fathers of genetic engineering at UCSF. He um, founded a department of molecular biology research, and by 1982 had discovered a number of things that could make the practicality of biotechnology as a pharmaceutical product a reality. So they founded the company, and then um, when they needed to expand their campus, they he had gone and visited Mexico City and stayed in Ricardo Legareta's Camino Real Hotel and had gone and visit Luis Barragan, who was a friend of Ricardo's, and had that sort of in mind. My dad then, later on, after the fiascos with the different architects, was reading a book about Ricardo and saw a, an article about a green, called the Greenberg House, which is a single family house here in Los Angeles, and was very impressed by it. Went and did some further reading on that and, and brought the, Ricardo to the attention of Bill Rudder, who was the chairman of the company, and the two of them decided to invite Ricardo Legareta to come and see them. The person who renovated the interior of his house worked with Ricardo Legareta on this project in Texas, and that's how the introduction was met. And these were the key players in, in the, or not the key players, but these, this was the, um, the core staff of the people who were organizing the project. Um, uh, everybody from the project manager in Mexico to the, the person who really organized tomes of, of, of books to be able to organize the spaces and to try and figure out their space requirements, Ricardo. And then this was the, really the chief designer of Ricardo's office, a guy named Benjamin. This is a guy named Steve Johnson. He um, was a project manager for this new Chiron facility, um, and he came from Bechtel, actually. And it was a curious uh, mix of, on Ricar one side is Ricardo Legareta, uh, and on the other you have somebody like Steve Johnson who comes from Bechtel, which is an engineering company that, and his idea of architecture is what the color of the glass is going to be on the front of the building. And everybody had a real learning process through this whole thing. Um, this is a, uh, uh, floor plan of the Camino Real Hotel, which uh, Ricardo Legareta did in 1967. And it featured in very strong interior courtyard spaces, um, very strong Mexican architecture, which you'll see in a minute. And the courtyard spaces, which seem very important to Chiron because of the idea of courtyard spaces as being a, a focal point for um, for community life within a building and define a space that's set apart from its surroundings. That's great because that's the original California architecture, the hacienda and everything. Yeah. Built around. It's not even Mexican, it's really Spanish. Spanish. It's really Spanish. Yeah. yeah, well, Spanish brought in their colonial type of uh, systems uh, into Mexico when they. Did you study anything about the development of that, what pressures there were, and, and, and were that sort of. Was that all really Moorish, or were there other influences? Oh, I, d I haven't looked at it, what the, the, what the influences in Spain were. Yeah. Clearly it was, I think, to a certain degree, oh, yeah, Moorish. And it was also considered for, um, you could have open courtyard spaces so that you'd allow for more breeze to be able to pass through the house in the warmer climates. But it also implies a certain kind of community, too. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and again, that community became very important to Chiron because they want to maintain that sense of community for the scientists. That's brilliant. This is uh, the entry courtyard into the Camino Real Hotel. And you can see the, some of the signature things, the, the very strong, bright colors, the primary forms that Ricardo likes to work with, the elements of water and so forth that would really begin to break up um, and give a human uh, character or quality to the space, and also the, um, the exactness of the proportions that he works at in this building. This is the entry space into the Camino Real Hotel. And you can see uh, the, the quality of the spaces themselves have a very strong definition, almost in a um, Mies van der Rohe sort of fashion. One thing that Ricardo <laughs> really loves is the handcrafted character of what can be built in Mexico City, or in Mexico for that matter. And that the labor here is so cheap that you can wind up doing incredible things like this whole ceiling is a series of six by six um, boxes that is a box, gap, box, gap, box, gap. The entire ceiling, the whole thing made of plaster. It must have been taken months to build. But because you're in Mexico, you could afford to have that kind of labor to be able to take care of that. But he really loves the idea of the hands craftsmanship and that things don't have to be perfect, in fact. And in fact, if it's uh, not less perfect, but a, a tangibility to it, which, is, um, which can be obvious in the architecture. Um, some, this is a, his entry into his own uh, studio, and you can see the pottery and almost this Mesoamerican kind of chair and the very rough-hewn uh, rock wall to the, to the rear. Again, tying into Mexican traditions. This is a factory he did um, in Mexico called for the Renault, uh, Renault Car Company, and this is one of his projects that he really wanted to... Um, that he did in a way that he introduced it to the the the, peop the staff at uh, uh, at Renault as being a very humane environment for the people who work there, not only for the uh, executives who work there, but also for all the workers as well. This is a view of one of the entries into that. This is the Solana. This is his first foray into American architecture, apart from the single-family houses here. This was a spec office buildings in in Dallas. Where? Dallas. Oh, Dallas. Yeah. Um, this is a a spec office building in Mexico City. Again, you can see the, the primary forms, the primary colors he likes to work with. But again, the rough-hewn texture of the of the walls. This is a art museum in Monterrey. And again, you can see the, the importance of the interior courtyard spaces themselves as acting as a soul for the project. And then this is uh, the same museum on, on an exterior courtyard space. Who's sculpture? I don't know. I'm not sure. I can find out for you. So everybody and their grandmother is familiar with Pershing Square downtown. Well, there's a number of architectural issues. I think this is really important for Ricardo, actually, because through this project, he was able to learn about the process of working with community groups, making presentations to city councils, to design review committees, to all the people who were involved in the funding of this thing. So I think this was an extremely important project for him to be able to learn about the process of dealing with the realities of large-scale construction in the United States. You know, in Mexico, you could just you have one guy who says, I want to build it here, and he has control over the whole area, and he just does his thing. He knows who to pay off. <laughs> Doesn't he have to pay off? It's, it's all in place. Ricardo just takes care of it. In this case, in a project of this type and in the project of Chiron, there's an incredible amount of public interface that has to go on. And the necessity to learn how to present your projects really well and very clearly so that everybody from architects, engineers, to the lay people understand the project is of incredible importance, and I can't stress that high enough. And then this is an interior shot of one of the uh, um, of the spec office building in Dallas. And you know, one other thing that always struck me about the Pershing Square project, to me, in many ways, it doesn't work. And, and I, and I, <clears throat> and it always seemed a little over formal and austere. Mm -hmm. But I see now that I've seen his other work and, and, and listened to you talk, that the thing, the thing that doesn't quite jive for me is the particular sense of ceremony that he tried to introduce mm -hmm. that I think L.A. doesn't really get. That's right. It's a very informal place, Los Angeles, to a large degree. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a highly, highly ceremonial part. 
Yeah. Right. It's really, uh, uh, okay, thanks. And the, and the programmatically, too, I think he was doing, he, I think the programmatic questions for him were a little bit out of his hands as well. So yeah. I, the way that he, we can get into a million discussions about that. Yeah, Let me just no, keep go going. ahead. But uh, it, it enriches my view of the part. Yeah. This is um, the architecture or the landscape architecture of Peter Walker. He's a landscape architect who worked with Ricardo on the Solana project in Dallas. And they, he recommended to Chiron that, uh, Ricardo recommended to Chiron that they use Peter Walker as well. And so Peter Walker tries to work with a very poetic idea of landscape and does not simply try and recreate nature, but tries to understand its, its place and location, either in a rural or urban setting. These are the first set of plans that uh, um, came from Ricardo's office. This is uh, Hollis Street along the top side here. This is Horton. Their existing buildings were right in here. And um, this major road down here, Powell Street, leads down to the existing city hall. Um, the old city hall is placed in this location over here. And there's a new train station on this side. What Ricardo really began to suggest at this point was to create a fully integrated campus that would actually cut off 53rd Street that came through here and to create a real street scheme along uh, Horton Street here so that um, they're no longer just buildings simply fronting onto it, but in fact, parking along this side and laboratory buildings on this side would create a street scheme across there. Why? Why not keep it within the confines of that larger rectangle? To a certain degree, well, for one thing, the overall master planning called for uh, the campus to have to spill out all the way to this point, especially in terms of the required amount of parking area. Um, so they also wanted to be able to integrate it into the city to a certain degree um, in certain locations, but also maintain some sort of security for the buildings. There is a security question for the buildings because of high technology research, things that might get ripped off, people who are worried about animal research and so forth. So. Um, but on the other hand, Chiron did not want to be a bad neighbor by any means by just building this campus and shutting everything down. They wanted to still have a feeling that the community was invited into it. Um, this, is, this is a view of the first uh, overall master plan. On the corner here, you have a high-rise um, office tower, a series of um, interior courtyard spaces in between um, laboratories a conference center here, and then parking along this side. Um, and then you can see the open spaces that are, that are running through here, um, as well as some of the existing buildings that might be maintained. And then he's referring clearly for here, for example, in this water feature to the Alhambra, which is in Granada, Spain, or to, um, uh, I'll get back to that. This is a view of that 53rd Street that um, I was mentioning, not 53rd, the uh, Horton Street that the buildings would actually front onto and would develop a street scheme along there. This is a view of one of the laboratory complexes that he was suggesting. By no means was he actually looking at these buildings as actually being able to work. I mean, they're a disaster in terms of cost and square footage and usability and so forth, but it was a very powerful per first stab at design of this complex because of the interior courtyards that were created, the walkways that uh, connected the buildings, and the idea of um, the separation and the amount of light that would be allowed into each of these different buildings here. And then he referred to, say, this uh, juncture here um, to some of the colonial architecture in Mexico. And you can see a view here of different connecting walkways that would go between the different buildings. This is another view of a juncture between one laboratory building and another laboratory building here with a street uh, life down below and connecting walkways above. And then he also referred to the uh, Camino Real Hotel, which Bill Ryder had stayed in before. Um, and then as time went on, the design begins to progress in a way that things like the courtyards begin to become a little bit more defined. They, each of the courtyards inside each of these buildings here coming across there begin to have their own character and life. The definitions of some of the outdoor spaces become stronger. And at this point, they actually begin, they uh, propose to create a loop road across here and actually shut down the road coming through here. So they're, 
their initial intention, which was to actually perhaps invite the public through here, in the end, they wanted to bring it down through here because it would actually make for uh, easier access to the parking and allow for um, Chiron to develop its own campus much more thoroughly. There's a logic to that. You really can't fight it. Yeah. And then uh, uh, this is the beginning of, of a prototypical plan of one of the laboratory buildings. So you can see the interior courtyards here, the offices around the outside there, the connecting walkways that come through there, and the laboratory spaces. So you have a support laboratory space in here, different labs coming through there, and then on both sides, elevators and uh, stairwells, as well as uh, heating, ventilation, and cooling uh, areas that allow for ducts to be able to go up and down through the building. And then the beginnings of studies of the interiors of the, uh, the courtyard spaces. This is a view, uh, this is a section through the building, another section of the building. And the most important thing about this slide is actually if you look at this elevation from the east, this is the high-rise office tower, and these are the laboratory buildings that go across the front there. If you notice, the design of this actually has a very strong wall along this side here. And that wall, as you'll see, became a very important negotiating position with the city. That Chiron and Ricardo were making a very strong stance with, by having such a strong wall here. And as you'll see during the negotiation process, process with the city, that wall begins to break down to a certain degree, allowing for things that I'll be showing you in a minute. So while this wall may be a certain sort of conceptual idea that's very strong and has proportions and so forth, it's also to a certain degree a negotiating position on Ricardo part, Ricardo's part. And in fact, in the long run, his design will change quite a bit. But understanding what the process with the city was going to be like forced this initial stance that would begin to break down almost in a lawyer type of fashion. This is uh, that view of that um, elevation, and you can begin to see that they then began to create a whole street scheme along here. Oh, shit. So uh, this is the office tower, and you can see that coming across here is trees, little courtyard areas, fountain, sculptures. And there's actually some suggestion now that along in here is going to be uh, retail spaces. And this is the main entry into the complex. The uh, city was very anxious to have that develop along there because... Um, Where's that structure you just showed us with the dome? Uh, yeah, it's down here. What they were anxious about was that this area become uh, not just warehouse spaces, but that projects like this project would become a generator of a real street life for the rest of the city. So it wouldn't be just more industrial development, but in fact that there would be some possibilities that part of the project could be given over to a retail-like Third Street thing along um, Hall Street. So that is actually down to the south. This is the old city hall, which they wanted to connect the old city hall along this road of Hollis Street. And this is moving down through Hollis Street. And you can actually see the new the Legoretta building being built. That connects down to a railroad station and a new retail complex that's nearby. And then now you can begin to see how this is beginning to break down. It's an, it's an interesting change from the initial solid wall to how the, the forms are beginning to um, break down in scale. And you can see um, treatments out in front of it. And these are a series of images of, of the first conceptual idea, or the, I would say the end of schematic design for the, for the master planning of the campus. And what we're looking at now is a view from an upper level with a series of offices on the top that you can walk through these different uh, pedestrian connectors over to the um, office tower at the end. And then down below uh, is the uh, courtyard spaces. This is a view of the, um, the first fit completed master plan of the campus. And that has all the basics that, uh, um, that we spoke about before. Um, each of the laboratory buildings along in here, the uh, communal conference center there, parking along on this side, and the office tower on that side. And are, the, um, are the kind of whispers of Aztec architecture deliberate? Oh yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. And on the far side over there, you see some little pimple of a office tower over there. And all they did was put that there just simply to maintain a holding place for uh, the possibility of perhaps building out something there someday. They had no intention of doing so, but they had to negotiate height limits with the city and so forth. So in order to justify the maintenance of those height limits, they had to do sort of silly things like that thing. So in any case, this is Hollis Street along here. This is the Horton Bypass along the, the back side there, whereas Horton Street used to run through the middle of it. They really wanted to bring it around to the outside. Parking along the upper side there, um, Central Utility Plant that's here that would provide hot water, cold water, heating and, uh, heating and cooling for the buildings, um, and power generation as well. Do you know what, what percentage of completion is this project at right now? Right now, they're working on this building. You'll see. What's the ETA for the completion of the campus? July. Oh, for the whole campus? Mm -hmm. 2010 was the projected completion of the whole thing. And it came out to a nice, cool $1 billion. However, <laughs> Did the architects get on it? <laughs> no, no, not quite. <laughs> now, if they completed all these buildings, perhaps they will. <laughs> Which reminds me that part of what the whole process of this was, was that Ricardo was not the only one doing the laboratory design work. In fact, they uh, had an associate architect named uh, Earl Walls, who was a laboratory planner, and FLAD. It was out in Wisconsin. Flat's a big A&E firm out in the middle of Wisconsin. They've done a million different laboratory and manufacturing complexes. Ricardo, in his life, could never do a facility of this type on his own. No way. However, um, working with somebody like uh, FLAD Associates, who have done laboratories until they're blue in the face, they really came to a very interesting level of negotiation between architectural intentions that Ricardo would bring about in the project and the realities of what um, they knew they needed in terms of laboratory planning that I indicated before. So there was a, it was a very complex pro process of people going to Mexico City, people going to Emeryville, people going to Madison, Wisconsin, and the number of meetings that were required in order to be able to make a project like this really viable was beyond belief. And then now this is a view along that Hall Street. This is uh, um, that office tower and the uh, an entry courtyard there. Moving along, you can see the class of Ricardo sort of proportioning of the buildings, the suggestion, suggesting to use the brick along this side, uh, some kind of integral color concrete system, and then the infusion of the very rich colors that Ricardo thinks is very important, and the exactness of the proportions that are worked out with the uh, window systems and the uh, arches and so forth. In addition, there was, uh, before there was a suggestion of different vertical flues, for example, to be able to eject the exhaust out of the building. In fact, it was all then combined into a single cone that was lopped off in order to hide those kinds of mechanical things. This is uh, another view of the, that courtyard uh, along Hollis Street. So it's very interesting how the negotiating position went from the point where you had the strong walls to it actually breaking down to a large degree on this side, which I think they wanted to do anyway. But what they were uh, able to do on the, in the long run was allow for 53rd Street to be able to close off, to be able to allow uh, Horton Street to close off and create an internalized campus beyond this facade here. That's all approved? Yeah. That's all oh, it's all, it's all approved. This so is in fact, they did what they wanted to do. And the whole thing about integrating with the committee was, with the community was uh, a bit of a thing. A bit, yeah. But on the other hand, they are giving up a certain amount of space on the front side there to allow for retail spaces along here and that people would just be able to park and grab a video or whatever the case might be. And again, you can see the classic Ricardo Legoretta. Uh, he can be a little formulaic, there's no question about it, but um, it's a formula that I think works in a lot of respects. Then this is a view of the entry into the campus, moving into the public spaces and then moving into a um, uh, conference center, which initially the conference center was set within the complex and it was thought that perhaps the community might be able to use it, but the conference center would, also, would be primarily for the scientists here. And eventually you'll find that the conference center is, is moved out to a location where the general public would have access to it as well. Is, is, is 
there, the Carnar complex is actually also accommodating retail, what was going to lease retail space That's right. within its property. That's so right. So Chiron's actually managing leases as well right. within right. that environment. That's right. Was that part of the deal? Um, was that something that you wanted to do? It's not part of a formal deal, but that's what the city would like. Nice and, yeah, and they, they have designated part of the building to do that. Um, at some point when the rest of the campus is built out, they can certainly just change it right over to become, become that. Uh, this is further studies of how the laboratories begin to work. Studies of the internal courtyard spaces. Um, this is an enclosed courtyard, so that no matter what the uh, the weather, you you come from the uh, story below, you rise up in an elevator here in a glass elevator. So the idea is you rise up into the space and then um, get this wonderful, rich experience as you move up into here. And then you go up a set of stairs um, or come across um, to your laboratory suites. And then these, this is studies of the open air courtyard space on the uh, north side of the building. Uh, exterior elevation studies, different uh, treatments on the exterior, um, concrete frames perhaps, or arches, or there are a number of different studies f to create a sort of a, a breeze soleil in the front of the building. This is a fairly close to what the final form actually looked like. Uh, you can see the, the laboratories out towards the exterior of the building, a set of offices that would um, back up against the laboratory to allow the scientists to be able to um, have access visual access into the laboratory and the access to the offices will actually be along this um, this walkway here. The two internal courtyard spaces and then this is very sort of new thinking laboratory design which is to have what's called a fellow area. This person might be working on uh, cancer research. This person is doing pharmaceutical um, genetic engineering of a vaccine. Now maybe their techniques can help each other, but they won't realize it unless they sort of rub brains in a place like this. So these types of fellow areas are becoming rather important in... Um, How is that program? Library space, coffee area. Um, a lounge. A lounge, exactly. And also this is where the elevators come, come up in the stairs as well. So you might wander out here, have coffee, and look over at uh, this water feature here, for example. Um, and it just, it makes for a place in which people can chat. It's interesting chat. because at the school we've tried several half-hearted attempts to create that kind of space. Totally failed every time. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see if it works. Maybe these people just stay in their labs the whole time. But I suspect actually people will be spending some time there. Um, Finishing off this, again, like I said, laboratories, and then this is a laboratory support area, the kinds of things that do not need natural light, and people won't be spending as much time in here as they would be in here. Um, you can see a conference room tower that uh, juts into the um, uh, courtyard space there, and then the beginning of the, the color and treatments and the actual architecture beginning, beginning to come out. Another view of it. So you can see the enclosed courtyard and the open courtyard the there. Is the building under construction right now? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's gone some, through some so changes. but. Be done in July? Mm -hmm. yeah, you'll see. Yeah. Is this an atrium or something here? This, corner this right here? This is the main entry into it, and this is the atrium. So you enter on through here. I'll show you in a floor plan in a minute. So you enter in through here, you, you walk through the lobby, you get on the elevator, and then you come up into um, the lobby space there. And those terraces up there are. Are they planted? Are they activated? Oh, they're activated, definitely. These are all offices along the top side there, and then these are terraces that you'd be able to walk out onto and have a smoke or enjoy the views, especially on this side. The views to the uh, East Bay Hills are really wonderful. It's a weird combination of a factory and a church. I mean, that's well, that's, the, <laughs> that's what uh, the, really this is trying to get at. This lecture is indicating that I think that high technology and quality design can really mesh in a way that uh, can be very powerful. Um, these are studies of some of the uh, office suites that are joining the laboratories next door. Uh, studies of some of the office, the laboratory spaces. And then this is the final master plan. And the plan has basically stayed fairly consistent, but the, you can see the architecture has changed to a certain degree, but most importantly that this building, which is the uh, conference center and cafeteria, which used to be located in the central center of the building, has actually been moved out to the periphery so that the general public would be able to have access to this as well as the uh, Chiron community as well. 
In addition, there was a first thought to actually start building this building first, but they thought, well, if only that building was built, then it would feel like it was sort of off by itself and it was not connected. So they actually decided to build this building first. This is the, a view of the uh, conference center at the end of uh, Hollis Street along here, main entry into here, and then a, a water fountain and feature, and then the entry into the complex, and then the first building. So this is what the current state of the project is. This is the existing building, the Shell Oil buildings I showed you before. This is that big blue box that uh, I showed you a photograph of. And then this is that tilt-up concrete box that was down at the end of this parking lot down here. So this is the first building fronting onto 53rd Street here and the Century Utility Plant. They actually went and did full-scale mock-ups of the laboratories and offices so that uh, all the scientists would understand what uh, the size of the offices were and the way that the architecture would work. So this is a uh, open walkway that would front onto one of the courtyards and then you can see different proposals for different kinds of offices. So one office perhaps was going to be squared off, another one was going to have a vaulted ceiling, another was going to have a vaulted ceiling with different kinds of uh, soffit treatments on the interior. And the one they decided to f eventually go with was that one. So imagine this whole series of these arcades, uh, arcaded offices running across there, I think would be very quiet and elegant. The office sizes are actually smaller and became a negotiating position, but I think, um, with the scientists, but I think that uh, they're going to be very happy with it. And of course, how does the furniture within it actually integrate into the office? So it's no longer just a just generic office in which you just move some furniture into, but in fact, all the casework and everything is integrated into the office, and how do things like the diffusers actually fit into that as well. Then you have a window that looks into the library, uh, laboratory next door. So as uh, you know, many people have uh, reactions to strong colors, so they have to make sure that everybody knows that it's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> then this is moving from the office uh, spaces into the uh, laboratory. And then this is a mock-up of the laboratory itself. What uh, they're doing here, again, you can see uh, almost a generic nature to this lab, these long lab inches and so forth. But also that um, they're going to try and squeeze more scientists into these labs than with the laboratories that I worked on. They want to be able to justify the building financially, but in addition, that they feel like having more scientists together will allow them to cross-fertilize ideas more easily. And then they actually built um, half the lab and put in mirrors along one wall here to create the illusion of the entire size of the lab. And everything was very carefully thought out, everything from the ceiling system to the lighting system uh, to the, the col different kind of colors of the countertops. You can actually see that they were testing two different colors to see the way they would work in that space, the darker gray and the, the lighter sure gray. Is that? Yeah, it's a... Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is. I'm not sure. It's very resistant to... Um, acids and bases and so forth, and um, it's some kind of polymer. Um, is it an aggregate with it, or is it straight? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And then you can see the ceiling treatments here, and even things like where they're going to be able to bring the utilities down to be able to service the, the counters across there, because you have gas, bigots, and so forth inside there. That's kind of, can you go back a second? That's kind of unresolved, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> the other interesting thing too is here is what the height of this soffit is going to be um, because th this is all going to be gl glass along the side there and then beyond that glazing is the arcade um, and then the beyond that is uh, the views out to the ocean or the views up to the um, Oakland Hills. So the height of this soffit is very important. Now unfortunately what happened was that they actually had to build the soffit down to this point here, which I consider to be a disaster, um, because the height of this glass required um, structural glazing, which was much more expensive. Um, so it's those kinds of things that even though the ar architectural intention may have been pure, um, the reality of the cost of having structural glass at this point was just prohibitive. Why not just uh, section it off though? Section it off, meaning put, what? Put, put, put some structure in there so that you don't have to, you lose a hell of a lot of both I know. and. Uh, I know. Who, who worked on the interior on this thing? Who helped design this? Earl Walls is a group down in San Diego, and they 
been doing many laboratories as well, and they did. They were really in charge of the master planning, the interior. What's that. interesting is that very little of the theming that he came up with of these kind of curves and things like that actually ended up in the labs. In the labs themselves. Ricardo was involved in trying to, was looking at the ceiling systems themselves and improving them and not improving them and so forth. And he, wrote, he was excited about it getting involved. But again, the actual number of materials that were uh, available for laboratory um, uh, construction and so forth was, is still certainly limited. So and you, you couldn't do any custom work there? The, it's, to a certain degree, it's still going to be custom because they're going to order special cabinets and so forth. But. Um, they're doing the best they can. Yeah, it's just interesting to see the see the level of design just plummet. As right, soon as you actually I know. Get into the working I know. Well, what's going to happen is it's going to be filled with junk. It's going to have beakers everywhere. It's going to have chromatolic columns and so forth. So it's going to just overwhelm the lab in any case. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are the final floor plans of the first building going up the main entry, uh, lobby area, um, office support area. This is a manufacturing area, um, heating, ventilation, and cooling, and a loading dock on that side. A uh, set of elevators that go up to the next floor, which is more office space, heating, ventilation, cooling. This is a two-story space to allow for very large uh, fermenters and columns and so forth. This is the plan of the typical uh, office level. You can see the uh, support spaces, the main laboratories, the offices that front on to the courtyard spaces. Um, as you remember, there was a little small tower, a uh, conference tower over on this point, but actually it had to grow out in order to accommodate um, more program area. There was just more scientists and wanted more stuff, and it was considered to be a little bit wasteful to actually take over, to chew out that much space within the, the building. So while the, the original conception of the courtyards was incredibly important, they really began to break down when the realities of the project came in. But they really, they're willing to pay for this space here, and they're willing to allow for these light wells to come down in through here as well. So um, again, there was a compromise that had to be done. And Ricardo, at first, was quite against the, this filling in here, but he, um, but they really came to a certain level of, of compromise that everyone was happy with. Why not just add a level with you? Uh, the high restrictions, according to the negotiations with the city of Emeryville, wouldn't allow them to go up any further. And this kind of space also is also being used by, um, actually services a lot of people. So these people actually work up some formulas and mixtures and so forth that is, connected. is connected throughout the building. Can I ask you just a couple of questions? Is mm -hmm. this sort of like, is this modular system kind of repeated actually with variations? Is that how the campus is going to get that? Yeah, exactly. All the buildings will be basically the same. Yeah. And uh, is there any manufacturing at all, or is it purely research? And it's a research manufacturing in this space, which is a little bit different from full scale up manufacturing. And I'll show you a picture of a manu uh, So this is like prototype manufacturing. Exactly, exactly. Near the scientists, so they can talk back and forth and say, hey, this thing doesn't work. So it goes into yeah. systems, yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is a top level with a series of offices here, views down into the, um, uh, with a, Series of offices here, um, uh, more fellow area and elevators, and then on the either side is uh, um, additional offices and then outdoor courtyards or um, promenade space that would allow for views to the north. Um, and then this is the current state of the construction of it. This is the manufacturing facility that they inherited from Cetus Corporation. This is the uh, central utility plant, and then that's the um, the first building that's being built. One of the interesting things if you look at this building here is that it's actually asymmetrical now. That this used to be on top of this building, so there was a nice symmetrical building. But there actually be, there was a set of guidelines that came from um, a, another set of architects hired by the city that said we should have these buildings step down to a certain degree so they're not so massive. So that forced that change over on that side of the building. And then this is a view of the building close up, you can see the, the purples and the yellows and the uh, intermixing with the brick on this side. Oh. Who's the builder? Uh, Is it a large corporation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Name escapes me. Um, That's okay. I just wanted to put any of those got involved in. No, Bechtel was involved with it in the beginning, and that's who Steve Johnson was, and they were helping to do the programming and so forth. So, 
this is a view of the building from the entry side, and you can see the, the colors that they worked into the concrete there and the way that um, it would be a nice transition from the concrete of the existing uh, fabric to the con integral color of the concrete here, and then the way that would mix with the brick on that side. And you can see the purple of the, uh, of the top story there as the uh, Ricardo accent of color. So in conclusion, I just want to say that a project of this type is incredibly complex and that there are many heroes involved in the whole project. And while laboratory and high technology designs are very complicated by their own nature, and in fact, if the designer doesn't know what they're doing, they should certainly get some help, uh, the possibility for new projects of this type um, with real quality design cannot be uh, um, of this type are certainly still a real possibility today. Great. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. That was really good. That was very good. Wow. Cool. Well, we got on tape. So. All right. Well, I should see it to see how yeah, lucid I am. Yeah, if you want a copy of it, we'll, uh, we'll make one for you. That'd be great if you could. Thanks. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, well thanks for coming. You do? So, uh, yeah, 250 bucks. Oh, cool. Gordon. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> <laughs>